How many of you have ever heard the name Red Skelton? Several of you. Okay, that's probably several more than I expected. Red Skelton was an American comedian. And he made a very famous comment that is applying to me today. He said, Late to bed and early to rise makes me sleepier than most other guys. My wife and I have just been here since Monday. And whenever it is, whenever we come over, it seems like the second night is the worst night. And it hit both of us last night. We both got exactly two and a half hours sleep, even though we were just doing nothing. But, you know, it wasn't because we went to bed late. So, if during my lecture, my forehead, just, I'll, that'll snap me up, I'll be okay, but uh, I'm just letting you know. Now, in the four lectures today, we're progressing through in a manner that we think moves through the material in the most logical way. Paul did a lecture on atheism, and it, it, the contours of his lecture were philosophical in nature. I'm moving on to historical Jesus, but this is a general lecture that gives us a basis for did Jesus even exist? Now, I will be saying a lot of things about some more advanced things that I hope to unpack a little bit later. But most of this is general. You know, I just heard a uh, if somebody has a more up-to-date one, I'd like to have. I'd have like to have the information if you have it on how many in, in Britain, how many folks deny the existence, the, even the existence of Jesus. But I heard a figure about ten days ago, a poll in Britain, that 41 percent of Brits now say Jesus never lived. 41%. We're not asking whether he's the son of God. We're not asking whether he died on the cross for your sins. We're not asking whether he was raised from the dead. The man's got to live before he can do those things, right? And almost 50% of the folks over here doubt or deny that he lived. But let me tell you what's on the other side that may surprise you. We have a skeptic in North America. He may be the best known New Testament skeptic in the Western world. His name is Bart Ehrman. You'll hear me refer to him from time to time. That's because I always try to refer to the people like Paul did uh, earlier. I try to refer to people who do not believe, do not have virtually anything in common with us. And yet they're going to say certain things are true or false and help us make a case. Bart Ehrman wrote a book critiquing people who think that Jesus never lived in history. And it's called, oh, by the way, I should tell you who, what he calls himself. He calls himself uh, an agnostic leaning toward atheism on the subject of Christianity. And he says, don't get upset with me if you, if you dislike something I say affirmatively about Christianity. He says, because if I do, I'm just telling you the way it is, because I am not a Christian. He says, I'm not a Christian. I am an agnostic leaning toward atheism. And yet he wrote a book directed to people who say Jesus probably never lived or never lived. It's called Did Jesus Exist? And he gives, if you allow for the things you know he's going to say, because he's an agnostic leaning toward atheism, you allow for those things. The rest of the book reads like an apologetics book. It reads like a defense of Christianity. I, mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself later, but here's an example. A lot of people in our culture believe that Jesus did not die by crucifixion. Bart Ehrman reminds us that in ancient history, one to two sources will often make an ancient event indisputable. If you have one source, it's often indisputable. Two, 
is a very strong argument for many ancient events because we just don't have sources that are that good. And Bart Ehrman gives 12 independent sources for the crucifixion of Jesus. 12 ancient independent sources for the crucifixion of Jesus. That's just one example of things we can build for the historicity of Jesus. It's, It's hard to explain why we have this problem today, though. Because the material is, is so good that probably the, best, the next best known skeptic in the West is a New Testament scholar named John Dominic Crossan. He's Irish, but he's lived and worked in the States for uh, a long time. And he said, I take it absolutely for granted that Jesus died by crucifixion in 30 AD. Absolutely for granted. Now, if he died by crucifixion, then he obviously existed. So that means John Dominic Crossan takes it absolutely for granted that Jesus lived. All right, that's, that's just kind of a little bit of an introduction of how I'm going to use these sources, but I'm going to cover a lot of material and uh, give you a lot of things that you can use with the, if the poll is correct, 41% of your British friends and colleagues who doubt or deny that Jesus ever lived. Okay, here's some categories for us. Canonical sources. Sources for Jesus that come from the New Testament. I'm gonna come back to these first two in particular, and then I'm gonna spend time with the last two. Archeological sources. It is true, there is not as much archeological data for, for New Testament truths as there are for Old Testament truths. But the archaeological evidence we do have is very, very helpful. So few, but few evidences from that category, but good evidences. All right, then we have non-canonical, but Christian. This means non-New Testament, but Christian sources. And I'm only going to use the ones that are very early. More about that uh, later. But this is Christian but non-canonical, and for some crazy reason, somebody gets, a lot of people get the biggest kick out of number four, secular sources. Secular sources for Jesus. Do you know that we have approximately a dozen and a half sources outside the New Testament, okay, non-New Testament, and non-Christian? Approximately a dozen and a half sources within about 150 years after the death of Jesus, which is a pretty fair, I wouldn't go, uh, I would only go rarely beyond 150, but 150 years in the ancient world is fair, and especially for the ones that are even less. But going about 150 years, we have about a dozen and a half sources for Jesus that report over 60 things They're mostly very short, a sentence here, a half a sentence there. Well, you get a paragraph, that's a lot. But you put it all together, and you get approximately 60 different items concerning the birth, uh, life, teachings, death, even the resurrection of Jesus, and some of the key beliefs in the earliest church and never open the New Testament, or never open a Christian source. Now, how can, how can someone think about 12, uh, 12 to 18 sources, 60 different reports about him, and then say, yeah, I thought so, he uh, never lived, obviously. How do you make that jump? I just think that in our society, there is a lot of dislike of Christianity and a lot of dislike that cannot be countered fairly by good evidence. So what happens is people go after it other ways. And I'm sure, I'm positive, there's a lot of angry Christians in the world. But among some of the rabid atheists the ones that believe that do not believe that Jesus even lived, there's an, an inordinate amount of anger. And uh, 
I mean, I'm t I teasingly say to my grad students, I only teach at the uh, PhD level, and I, I, I just taught a course in historical Jesus. And I tell these folks, sometimes the atheist will say, uh, when you make a comment like I just did, there's an inordinate amount of anger. They'll say, I'm not angry. It's like some of it's it's the historical, well, it's more of a autobiographical side of what Paul's saying when someone says, no, there's no truth in the world, you know, including this one. Or uh, we can't know anything for sure. Oh, do you know that for sure? This is sort of the, the other side of that. Uh, you know, I'm not angry, and, and they're very angry. It's, and it seems to me that many of the critics, just an observation, many critics have stopped referring to Christianity and trying to refute our views with facts. In our country, obviously I'm more familiar with it in the U.S., but in our country, critics of Christianity are more and more relying on legislating Christianity out of existence. Okay, fine, you think it's true? Just shut your mouth and don't bring it up in public. We just heard about, it was on the news, that doesn't mean it's true, but we just heard about a, a high school teacher in the U.S. who made a young lady in his class take off a cross necklace that she had on. He said, you may not wear it in this class because a cross necklace is a gang symbol. A gang symbol. So do not wear a cross to this class again. So see, I can't argue you down on the cross, but I'll legislate you down in the sense that this is my classroom and what I say goes and you will not wear a cross to my class. It's prejudicial. And it's connected with crime and gangs. Things are just getting rough, it doesn't, but doesn't help if we just sit there and say, well, it's all about faith. And I'm just going to tell you what my heart says. And now there's some pretty sophisticated arguments based on Christian experience. But this isn't one of them that we're doing today. I'm going to try to give you good evidence. And why go back to Bart Ehrman? Bart Ehrman says, virtually no scholar in the field, that's the key, Virtually no scholar in the field. If your field is architecture and you tell your class you don't think Jesus ever lived, that would be about like me making comments about architecture. And I don't know, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. But if he's going to talk about historical Jesus, and many of the people that go off on Jesus are out of the area, they're English teachers. That's a very common one, by the way. English and literature teachers that go off on Christianity. But you have to be in the field. This is Bart Ehrman talking, the skeptic. And who's in the field? New Testament scholars, theologians, historians, classicists, people who teach the classics, archaeologists, philosophers. Now, philosophers don't so much deal with data, but they deal with, as you got from Paul, you get the structure of arguments, how to structure arguments from philosophers. See, that's why we have philosophy of everything, philosophy of medicine, philosophy of law, philosophy of, you tell me, philosophy of history is an area I work in. I, er I work in the area of philosophy of psychology. We have philosophy of, because philosophy, I am not a psychologist. But I work in the area, and I've taught many PhD courses on how philosophy works, how psychology works as a discipline, and I'm not a psychologist, because philosophy of psychology is philosophy. So that's why philosophers are needed, but they're not, they don't do a lot of the spade work. Some of the other ones do that I said. Now let me say something about canonical sources. I made the comment that I teach just grad uh, PhD students. The next point is one of the simplest points I or anybody else could make, but it is the most difficult one for my graduate students to grasp. 
I have to say it several times from several angles. Seriously, this is seriously it. Because it is so simple, we read into it and we make it way more complicated than it is. I'll use the example, a uh, number of years ago at Easter, I was asked to write an article for the Washington Post. Now, I don't know if it's true, but um, we often hear that the Washington Post is the second most liberal newspaper in our country, second to the New York Times. And they asked me to write an op-ed piece for Easter on how do we know the resurrection of Jesus happened for a really liberal newspaper. All right, so I said, I'll be glad to. They said, you've got 800 words. Well, it's not very many, but I said, I'll take it, gladly. If you're going to give me an audience like, like you're going to give me, I'm glad to do that. I was visiting with my, uh, my wife and I were visiting with our daughter that day, Easter. I decided to take, check the computer and see what was going on with the argument at the paper uh, that came out that morning. And the responses were pouring in like crazy. It ended up getting 600 and something responses. And the first dozens that came in were just, the majority of them were angry. And they were saying things like, WAPO, which is what they call Washington Post. They said, WAPO, this is beneath you. You can't do articles on religion because that's a matter of faith. You have no evidence for this kind of stuff. And so I started the article like this, and this is the point I want to make, the one that's hard to grasp, but it's really, really simple. I started out and I said, I'm going to quote a verse or two in this paper, but I'm not going to quote any text that's not accepted as historical or authoritative unless it is accepted by skeptical, agnostic, or atheist New Testament scholars. I will only accept the ones they accept. One of the most incredible things that people just don't get is if you quote the Bible, right away they'll start screaming. I mean right away. And they'll say, you're arguing in a circle. Why? I don't accept the New Testament. Well, you know, I could say, well, I don't accept your source. But, you know, that goes down, that's a self, that's a little problematic path because then you both just end up yelling at each other if you're not careful. But I'll say, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, time out, you just violated the rules. You're supposed to prove everything you're saying. Okay. When I cite the New Testament in my next two lectures tonight, I'm only using text that critics accept. What does a critic accept? Well, think of it this way. What if you did a master's thesis in history And here's your topic. Do we learn anything about an ancient city called Troy from Homer's Iliad? You know, that's poetry. It wasn't meant to be taken as history. Okay. But are there a lot of figures? Richard the Lionheart in your country. Are there a lot of figures? Robin Hood. Here's maybe the best, King Arthur. Did any of these people live? Now, I'm not going to try to settle these things, but did they live? And if so, how much can we know? Most, almost all the reports of King Arthur are medieval, but he was supposed to have lived about the 5th century. That's not very helpful as a historical source. But can we hear, can we know anything about him? Well, there's some early sources. Okay, well, I'll reconsider. Got earlier sources. So, when when I'm citing scripture, I'm going to cite passages that critics allow you to use. And get this, if you don't use them, they will use them. Why? Why? Because they're reliable texts. You go, well, give me an example. 
Here's the best example I can give you. There's 13 books that bear Paul's name in the New Testament. Critics will unanimously, Bart Ehrman, the skeptic, calls them the undisputed texts. They will unanimously let you use seven of those 13. And believe it or not, the seven they let you use are the seven evangelicals want to use. You're like, what? Here's the ones that all specialists, can't be the guy in the English department, but if it's one of the specialists, here's what they allow. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, Philemon, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, Philemon, seven. They'll let you use them. Go, how do they let you use them? They're authoritative. What's authoritative mean? They don't believe in inspiration. No, they don't. They don't believe in any inspiration, but they definitely don't believe these seven books are inspired. Okay, now I'm really puzzled. Why do they let you use those seven books? Because they think Paul wrote them. They think it's undisputable that Paul wrote them, and Paul is an authoritative source. What's authoritative mean? Well, for starters, he was in the right place at the right time to get the right material. Okay, so what's that look like? Well, Paul's a very smart guy. A friend of mine, before he passed away in 2010, a lot of you know the name, one of your countrymen here, Anthony Flew, the world's, well, on the cover of a book that he co-wrote before, shortly before he died, it says, how the world's most notorious atheist changed his mind. The world's most notorious atheist. Graduate of Oxford, taught at Oxford, and Anthony Flew says it short and sweet about Paul. He says, Paul is a first-class philosophical mind. I asked him one time, I heard him say it so many times, and he sa- I said, why do you say that? He said, read the book of Romans. Now, he doesn't mean, that doesn't mean he believes everything in the book of Romans, but he knew Paul believed it and it comes on a good authority, and the man knows how to put an argument together. He called Paul a first-rate philosopher. He called Jesus a first-rate ethicist. I'm not sure exactly why the distinction. Maybe he thought Paul was a little more, that his subjects were closer to philosophy and Jesus is to ethics. I don't know, but he had great respect for both of them, and he became a theist before he died, by the way. So they're not going to dispute those texts. So Paul, very smart, trained the right way. If you believe the book of Acts, Paul studied under Gamaliel. That would be like you pulling some name out of a hat and saying, well, I did my DPhil at Oxford, or I did a PhD at Cambridge under so-and-so. And oftentimes you get branded by your chief professor, right? And, you, and the better the professor, better chance you have of getting a job, and so on and so on and so on. All right, Paul's one of those guys. He's a great teacher. He had disciples. He was honest. Well, what does that mean? Well, Paul might not already always have been right. Remember, these guys don't believe in inspiration. Paul may not have always been right for the skeptic, but he won't lie to you. He'll tell you the truth. And he was in the right time, right place to know the truth. How do you know? Because he knew the 12. He knew the big guys in particular, but that's going to wait until the next two lectures tonight. But he was intimately familiar with three, the other three of the big four, and he's the fourth one. The four most influential Christians in the early church are Peter and John from among the 12, and Paul and James, the brother of Jesus, both called apostles, and had the rank of the 12 
later. So Paul's right place, right time, schooled, very intelligent, good thinker. He would not intentionally lie or mislead you. If you think Paul's lying, that's something old out of fairy tale books from 200 years ago. Scholars don't believe that today. Well, I know this guy who does. He is almost for sure not a specialist. All right, so if I were going to quote canonical sources, you could say, well, I'm not going to take the seven. If I can't get all 13, I'm not going to talk to them. Yeah, that's a little strong. These guys won't let you use all 13 of his books. But why not take the seven if he's going to give you the seven, especially when the seven are the strongest ones, like Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians. Those are great sources for history. So that's what I mean when I list canonical sources. And I'm dead serious. I have never looked at Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? I mean, I've read it in great detail, but I mean, I've never counted how many verses he, he quotes as authoritative in the New Testament. But if you don't use the New Testament, he will, because the sources are very good. All right, I'm not going to say too much more this time about canonical or archaeological, but let's go ahead and talk about some things that are less known. Non-canonical Christian sources. Here's some incredibly early writers. Do you know that Clement of Rome, a couple things about Clement. This may be the same Clement that Paul mentions in the book of Philippians. So he could have ties to the canonical book of Philippians. He could have been a disciple of Paul's. Some people called him the first pope in Rome. But I mean, I'm just getting to the point that he was the you know, he was there at the beginning. And uh, some of you thought Colin was the first pope, didn't you? I've heard that just walking around the building here a little bit. But Okay. Clement of Rome, 95 AD. Something else about that. Before the canon is even completed, which is usually said to be 100 AD, this book predates the close of the New Testament canon. That's early. Right place, right time. You can get his material. You can read him. And those of you who know I, I do a lot of things on the resurrection, you know I'm going to be very happy with chapter 42 in First Clement, who says that Jesus was raised from the dead, the disciples learned his teachings, and by virtue of his resurrection, we know that his disciples' teachings are true, and Jesus' teachings are true. Clement said that in 95 AD. We call that apologetics. And we have that early argument for before the canon's even closed, but it's not a New Testament. Of course, it's in the New Testament too, but I'm not using a New Testament book. So this has the advantage of people who don't want you using books in the canon and don't understand that principle that the critics will give you these books. Ignatius, just a few years later, 107, Ignatius wrote seven epistles on his way to martyrdom. And, you know, he's frequently considered a, a saint. I mean, believers are saints, but I mean called a saint in the church and died a martyr's death, as did Polycarp. Polycarp wrote one epistle to the Philippians. Now, there's later a book written about him called The Martyrdom of St. Polycarp, and that dates later. That's about 150. But he died a martyr. Papias this is a kind of a sad one. If there was one book at this time that scholars wish we had, but we don't, you go with it. How can you say anything about it? Because a fair number of fragments exist and statements about the book exist. Papias wrote a book called Exposition of the Oracles of the Lord, <clears throat> about 120 AD. Subtract 100, if that's the date for the close of the canon. And this is only 20 years after the canon was thought to be closed. 20 years. Now, just a martyr, I think we're getting too late here, probably, to be, help, to be real helpful. But just a martyr is writing just 120 years after Jesus died. And he's got a lot of material on the historical Jesus. The first apology, the second apology, he's got a dialogue with the Jewish man named Trifo, where he develops arguments for the truthfulness of Christianity, and so on. Secular sources, 
Roman, Jewish, Gnostic, and other. I told you about a dozen and a half. Oh, by the way, this is, I unpack these in a book called The Historical Jesus. My website, I do not sell anything on my website. So it's there for edification and for use. I've got a couple chapters on my website from a book that's still in print. That's why I don't put the whole book there. But the company said, yeah, go ahead and put a, your choice, a couple chapters on your website. And I put the chapter on my website that has these 18 sources. So you can get them for yourself. My website is GaryHabermas. Well, www.GaryHabermas.com, H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S. No bells and whistles, no uppercase, lowercase doesn't matter, uh, no dots or dashes or GaryHabermas.com. And I and look over on the left under the books tab, and there's a chapter there on secular sources. All of these are secular. Do you know what the earliest source for the historical Jesus outside the New Testament? In fact, it's earlier than almost anything in the New Testament, as far as we know, is a Greek historian named Thallus. I should have put I should have put Greek and Roman sources. But Thallus wrote a history of the Mediterranean world. I'm, I'm being totally above board with you, not just assuming that it's he's talking about Christ. It seems, scholars are pretty well agreed that he's talking about the crucifixion. But what he's discussing is the darkness that surrounds the world in the middle of the day and how the whole Mediterranean world was dark and earthquakes. You say, well, wow, that's something in the Gospels, isn't it? Yeah. But Dallas tells us that, and this could be dated. There's, there's discussion about this. It could be dated as early as 51 A.D., 51 A.D. for Thallus. Scholars, though, think unanimously that the best sources outside the New Testament for Jesus are two. The two best ones are Josephus and Tacitus. Tacitus, the Roman historian, who wrote about 118 A.D., so he would be about 88 years after Jesus. And Ta uh, uh, Josephus writes about 90 AD, so he's about 60 years after Jesus. Once again, like Clement, Josephus writes before the New Testament canon closes. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean his book should be in the canon. I'm just saying if you compare it to canonical books, you see it's very, very early. Josephus is dated before the date that most people give the book of Revelation or the Gospel of John. Josephus is probably earlier. Now, there are disputed portions in Josephus. Uh, if, we wanna, if you want to do that during the uh, Q&A, we can, we can talk about that. Gnostic sources. The Gnostic sources are later, but even uh, evangelical authors like, like um, Daryl Bach are bringing the dates for the Gnostic Gospels back closer to Jesus. Back meaning earlier, closer to Jesus. And now uh, some sources, some people are putting Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas, which is usually dated around 150, 160, which is getting, you know, late. Uh, Gospel of Thomas is sometimes brought back to about 125, 130, or, or about exactly 100 years after Jesus. The Gospel of Peter, about the same thing. It's kind of a weird book. You should read it sometime. Um, two angels come down out of heaven and go into the tomb to get Jesus. And when they come out of the tomb, they're carrying a person who's alive, but he's hurting, he's kind of out of it. And the angels are supporting him and he's been crucified. He's got all the marks of crucifixion. And the angels' heads go up to the clouds, but the one they're carrying, his head goes up way above the clouds. So there's some, you know, some wild things in there. You can see, you can see some of these stories developing. But 
the date for the Gospel of Peter's come back a little bit, and it teaches a resurrection. Thomas, some of the Gnostic books have been brought back to earlier dates. There's other uh, non-Christian sources. For example, one of the only ancient historians who was a philosopher of history, his name is Lucian, and Lucian wrote a book called How to Write History, and it's on principles of historiography. And he tells you, for example, um, we need eyewitnesses, he says. More about this tonight. He says, we need eyewitnesses. We need early sources. We need eyewitness sources. That sounds like a book on World War II or something. But it's in Lucian, second century. And Lucian tells us about early Christians. He makes fun of them. But his making fun of them teaches us what the early Christians were like. He said, you know what? If you want to make a really good living, here's how you do it. And, and apparently, this is more than a joke. He's really, he, there were really people who did this. He said, disguise yourself as a Christian prophet. He doesn't mean, you know, put dress on or do your hair some way or talk in stilted language. He said, just tell them that God has chosen you and you're a prophet and talk in holy terms and watch your language and watch what you say and what should you do. And they'll keep you around for a week, two weeks, three weeks. And if they really like you, they may keep you there for a long time. And since you're doing the Lord's work, they're going to feed you. They're going to put you up. He says, they're stupid. They're going to take care of you. And he says, now let me tell you something about Christians. This is Lucian. It's probably the longest ancient secular passage. He says, they treat each other as brothers. Well, that's not very negative, is it? That's, that's pretty cool. But he, he teaches it like it's a criticism. They're brothers. They think they're brothers. And they don't fear death. They don't fear death because their Savior was crucified. He calls Jesus the crucified sophist. He calls Jesus a crucified philosopher. Sounds pretty good, Paul? Crucified philosopher. Not the crucified part, but the calling Jesus the philosopher. We like that. That's good stuff. And they fear death. And if you get thrown into prison, if you convince them you're a prophet and you get thrown in prison, they're going to come and they're going to try to bail you out. They're really gullible. And they bring food, and they'll pass it in through the bars. And you'll be able to sit there and be wined and dined like a king. And some of them even pay the guards off, and they'll come into the cell with you and sit all night and encourage you. Ha, ha, ha. Look how stupid these people are. Now, these are pretty neat principles, though, about how they share and stuff. And Lucian's trying to make fun of Christians. But I like... I like things like crucified sophist. He, he died for them. He, they believe he died for them. They worship him. Uh, they're brothers. They're not afraid to die. They believe in the afterlife. And we have that from a pretty early date from a from well-known scholar who was a, a philosopher of history. Okay. So from these sources, what do we learn? I'm going to be going through these a little more quickly, but let me just hit a couple key doctrines. This is what the major texts teach us. Jesus' number one teaching was the kingdom of God and how to get there. Now, to make my point with graduate students, we often keep things very simple in graduate school. Instead of referring to books by covers, when an author has a number of works in the same subject, we go by, instead of going by titles, I should have said, I refer to books by their colors. I'll say, this is the orange book. This is the yellow book. And they get a real kick out of that. They think that's really cute. They're doing a PhD, and I'm telling them to take the orange book up. But that's because some of the titles are so close, you're better off talking about colors because you'll get the, somebody will say five minutes into the lecture, which title is this again? All right, number one teaching, the kingdom of God and how to get there. And I often tell people, 
The kingdom of God for Jesus is the yellow brick road to heaven. Yellow brick road to Oz? You could say it a little more biblically, right, than the yellow brick road to Oz. You could say the scarlet ribbon that runs through the Old Testament and teaches uh, with, without, the, without the shedding of blood, there's no sacrifice. I mean, there's no forgiveness of sin. And we go through the New Testament, and here's the blood, and here's the, here's the uh, you know, the center, what we call the gospel. We call it the, the, the scarlet ribbon. But Yellow Brick Road, you know, speaks, speaks it. Jesus said there's a kingdom. But watch this. A lot of Christians don't, they don't pay enough attention to the first word there, present. You know, Jesus said more about the present kingdom than he said about the future kingdom. Our pastor, and by the way, if you want to know, he studied under, and our pastor studied under uh, and is very much influenced by Dallas Willard, uh, a prominent Christian philosopher who's better known for really, I mean, he's a brilliant philosopher, but he's better known for what he did in terms of kingdom ethics and the teachings of Jesus. And uh, our pastor studied under him. And following Dallas Willard, he says this. He says, salvation is not a get-out-of-jail-free card using the Monopoly example. It is a get-out-of-jail-free card, but it's not just a get-out-of-jail-free card. The path to heaven says, when you come to Christ, take the verses in John, you have eternal life. What are you doing right now? How are you living above things in this world? Take those verses from Lucian. What are you doing with other people that would make you brothers and sisters that would help you to visit people in prison and take them food and suffer with them and weep and mourn and, and rejoice with them, as Jesus said? And what about not being afraid to die? What are we doing right now in this kingdom? There are present aspects. Jesus said, "If uh, remember this when I get come back to it in a few minutes. Jesus said in a very powerful verse, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then know that the kingdom has come among you. It's already there. In Mark, the first words when Jesus preaches, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. And the kingdom was present in the preaching of Jesus, phase one. Phase two is when God, you know, a kingdom has a king. And phase two is when the king really rules in the whole kingdom. So here it's in part. You say, well, I, that's pretty common. Yeah, I think that makes sense. But you'd be surprised how many Christians are kind of offended by that first word. I mean, they are. They think that, no, that's not what the New Testament, well, the, explain what Jesus means by the first phase. Jesus calls us to be involved with people now because of the final phase. I mean, there's a yellow brick road and there's, Oz, there's two things. What are you doing on the road? Because there's dangers, you know. There are lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. And there's a kingdom out there, and we want to get there. Present and future. The gospel. Whenever the gospel facts, I'm talking about the evangelion, the good news. I'm talking about the portion of the gospel that gets you through the doors of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom, whenever it is defined, it's chiefly in the writings of Paul and in the book of Acts. These three facts are always present. Deity, death, resurrection. We often say death, burial, resurrection. But burial is only there, I don't know, maybe 50% of the time. It is there. And other things are mentioned, but I'm saying these three are always present. Deity, death, resurrection. I'm getting ahead of myself to make one more comment. But in the New Testament, there are dozens, dozens. We want to unpack some of these, a whole lecture on this tonight, Lord willing. There are dozens of little creedal passages. They're called creeds, traditions, Confessions, formula. 
Those are pretty much more or less synonyms, and about 80% of them or more. It's the answer to the question, what did earliest Christian preaching consist of between 30 and 50 AD? What did early Christian preaching consist of before we got our very first New Testament book? What did the, I think it's the most exciting question in that early age. What did they preach and teach most centrally before we had a book? And the answer is these dozens of little tiny statements that go all the way back to the early 30s. The early 30s? I thought the Gospels were, I thought the Epistles were whatever dates. Yeah, 30s. Where do you get that? In a Bible college? No, just get it from Bart Ehrman, the skeptic. He dates these things 30 to 33 AD. And what does Lucian say about writing history? You want early eyewitnesses. Early eyewitnesses. By the way, Lucian tells a cute little story that a guy named Aristobulus came up to Alexander the Great, and he was taking a lot of notes on Alexander's life. And he gave Alexander this papyri report of his life. And Alexander looked at it, and it had him doing incredible things. It had him killing elephants with spears. And you know what Alexander did? He took the manuscript, he threw it overboard, Lucian tells us, into the ocean, and says, so, so should I do with you, you loser. That loser's a tight translation of the Greek. Um, he says, so should I do with you, because you make light of history and you report falsehoods. I don't kill elephants with, with spears. That's not true. And Lucian uses that as an example. You need to be, now Aristobulus was an early writer. He was there at the right time, but he didn't see Alexander kill anybody, any uh, elephant with a spear. So he's not an eyewitness of those events. And Lucian says, let's be good historians. So we need early eyewitnesses. So because we need early eyewitnesses, don't you think it's, it's helpful to have early New Testament passages that go right back to the date in question? It's very, very early. And then Jesus taught that you have the facts, but you say, I do, to Jesus. You make a commitment. You know, you can date somebody for 20 years. You could know that person better than anybody else in the universe. And you don't say, I do, and you're not married. That's the way it works. You say, for better or worse, richer or poorer, till death do we part, that's called commitment. And the Greek word for believe is a very strong word. It means, well, actually, John and Peter use it as synonym for walking in his shoes or sandals. They, they say walk in his steps. And you go, well, that sounds like works or something. Well, you explain this. John uses the word believe almost 100 times. John's a disciple of belief. And yet over and over again, he says, are you willing to walk in his steps? Are you committed to Jesus? And Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So there, there's, it's belief, but it's the belief, that I think the closest is, I do. I do. So these facts are true. Deity, death, resurrection, more about that. We're spending a lot of time on evidence on the last two lectures tonight about this. But you're not married unless you say, I do. So the question is, did you marry Jesus? That that's Jesus' teachings, his earliest teachings. And one more, social ethics. When the lawyer, now keep in mind, a lawyer isn't one that sues people in the first century and takes them to court. A lawyer is an expert on the law. Today in Christianity, a lawyer in this sense would be a New Testament scholar or an Old Testament scholar would be lawyers. And the lawyer comes to Jesus and says, what should I do that I should have eternal life? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your, and you know the four words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, 
mind. Read the commentaries. These are not body parts. He's not saying, love the Lord with your kidneys, love the Lord with your liver, love the Lord with your brain, love the Lord with your heart. Although those last two would make more sense. But Jesus is saying something like this. He's emphasizing it. And he's like, again, Jesus is saying something like this. All right, the first greatest command is, love God with everything you have. I say, everything you have. I say, love God with everything you have. And so in sum, love God with everything you have. You get the idea, this is kind of a radical commitment. Radical commitment. Love God with everything you have. And then he says, love your neighbors yourself. You know what's amazing about that? Jesus said it's his second greatest command. I want to ask you something. Oftentimes we get offended because people say, well, Christians don't follow the Lord as closely as we should. Well, well, seriously, I want to know. Tell me some area where we don't follow the Lord. Here's one. What's that? Okay, we know the kingdom of God and what to do. We might call that salvation, the plan of salvation. It's good news. Kingdom of God, how to get there. Yellow, Yellow brick road and... Oz, that's his number one teaching, kingdom of God, how to get there. But how many of us teach that the number two teaching is love your neighbor as yourself? That's equally radical. Love my neighbor like I love me? Moi? You? Like, moi? I, now nah, let's talk about something else. We should talk about um, Jesus' politics. Or we should talk about what Jesus said about this or that. Well, those other things might be important, but it's Jesus who said, this is the second greatest command. Jesus said the second greatest command is to radically love your neighbor. Remember Lucian again? They loved each other like brothers. They took food to them in the cell. When they were allowed, they got into the cell and sat with them and occupied time with them. They were not afraid to die. They were in community. That's commitment. And they did it. They're early. In Matthew 25, you know, go and visit them and so on. So social ethics, love God with everything. Number two, love each other with everything, equally radical. So these are Jesus' main teachings. All right, quickly, what did Jesus do? He is known as a miracle worker and an exorcist. You say, well, yeah, he is in our churches, but how about the liberals? He's known as a miracle worker and an exorcist. And liberal churches, what they believe about these miracles and exorcists can differ from person to person, but they do believe Jesus did what the Gospels call miracles and exorcisms. They believe that events just like those ones in the Gospels actually occurred. When I went to graduate school, I went to graduate school a long, long time ago. It was early 70s. And if you said you believed Jesus was a miracle worker, my colleagues would have known anybody who said that was probably either an evangelical or a conservative Catholic. But today, everyone believes he's a miracle worker in some sense. John Dominic Crossan? Yep. Marcus Borg? Bart Ehrman? Yep. This is significant. He modeled love, radically so. Some of the teachings he's best known for, the things that made Anthony Flew say first class philosoph- uh, first class ethicist, is that he taught greater love has no man that, that he should lay down his life for his friends. And toward the end of his ministry in particular, he quit calling his disciples his disciples. We didn't quit calling him that, but he started calling his disciples his friends. There's many passages where people say to Jesus, you could heal me if you want to. Please do it. He'll say, I want to. And he heals them. Or they'll say, have mercy on me. And he says, I do have mercy on you. Be healed. We can see these things come out, and he's the one who teaches, turn the extra cheek, turn the other cheek, give him the extra cloak, walk the extra mile, 
that comes from Jesus. Died by crucifixion, this is later tonight. Died by crucifixion, was raised from the dead. The tables have so turned on these. The crucifixion is, is virtually, is questioned by virtually nobody, nobody who's a specialist in the field. Bar, back to Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman says, there's, he says, as far as I know, there are only two fellows in the world who have good credentials, who believe Jesus probably didn't exist. That's Richard Carrier and Bob Price. He says, only two. And then Bart Ehrman says, and they don't teach in a university or seminary. His point was, there are no tenured or untenured university or seminary accredited. No accredited university or seminary professors in the Western world who are mythicists. None. And I think it's pretty clear that there are almost none. I mean, you get a handful who doubt his death on the cross. Well, how about the resurrection? I'll save this for tonight, but let me just make one comment. More people think that something actually happened to Jesus after his death than those who think nothing happened to him after his burial. The resurrection's in right now because the data are so good. It's incredible. All right. Here's six things for you. Conclusion. All of this, what I'm leading up to here, I've commented on most of these things. Here are six unique things about Jesus. I've got a, I've got a couple free eBooks on my website, no charge. One of them compares this Jesus to other founders of major world religions. And when you make these kind of comparisons, here's what you learn. Do you know he's the only founder of a major world religion who claimed to be deity? Muhammad never claimed to be deity. I'm not putting down Islam. Islam doesn't want you to claim he's deity because that's the one, that's the sin of shirk. It's the one unforgivable sin in Islam. You know the Old Testament, Moses, David, Daniel, they weren't called the son of God. Well, how about the other ones? Do you know that in the earliest literature, like Buddha, they think. This is a whole nother story. But Buddha comes from the Far East. So does Confucius of Confucianism. And so does Lao Tzu of Taoism. Do you know that in the earliest writings, they are naturalists? In the earliest writings, none of them believed in... The, now, it's not exactly like our naturalists today, but they were not supernaturalists. So obviously, they're not going to say they're... They're not going to say they're God. Jesus is the only one who claimed to be deity. He taught that he was the key to salvation. Even the critics believe this. They think he was wrong, but they concede that Jesus taught, what you do with me determines where you spend eternity. Rudolf Boltman thought that. And you're going to have to look a long way to find an accredited university teacher who's more liberal than Rudolf Boltmann. And he taught that what you do with Jesus determines where you spend eternity. So philosophers like to use a real heavy word, ontology. And ontology says more about what something is than what something does. And Jesus basically is saying yeah, a lot of people said, I'm giving you the words of life. That's pretty common among founders. But only Jesus said, I am the words of life, ontologically. I'm telling you something about me. I, you know, you know the yellow brick road? I'm the yellow brick road. I'm the path. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He's exalted in all the other religions. Even Judaism today, the trend is toward calling him a Jewish prophet. They're saying, why shouldn't we own him? He's ours. He's Jewish. 
perform miracles? According to a very well-known scholar, Edwin Yamauchi, a Japanese, um, but he's, uh, he's uh, an, he just retired, ancient historian, University of Miami of Ohio in the U.S., uh, he, he taught that oh, Jesus is the only one who did miracles where the miracles are recorded within a generation where we have early sources. Yeah, Buddha's believed to have done miracles. Here's the problem. Buddha's miracles are reported in sources from three to 500 and years and later. I'm not going to believe something for three to 500 years later. That's not history by definition. Died for the sins of the world? I'm talking about what he taught. He's the only one who said these things, that he died for the sins of the world. People die. But tell me another founder who said they died for the sins of the world, and tell me somebody whose Orthodox followers believe he was raised from the dead. Now tell me someone whose Orthodox, first of all, you we're talking about a major founder of world religion. That's a whole book there. Comparing Jesus to a major founder, you're not going to find one. But what if I said, now tell me one that says he was raised from the dead, and it comes from a very early eyewitness source, and it's, his name's not Jesus. Who else do you have? You're going to look long and hard. This is the bottom line. And for people who say we don't know who he is, I think Bart Ehrman's right. We're, paying, we're playing fast and loose with the evidence. If you just treat him, as Michael Grant says, not a conservative, ancient British, a Roman historian, Michael Grant said, just look at the accredited sources. All these things are true about him, and you can no more question the existence of Jesus than you can question the great people of history. Let, let me end with this quickest of stories. Years ago, I was debating a, a fairly well-known skeptic. He was one of the mythicists. He's passed away recently, but uh, a well, very well-known mythicist, wrote a lot of books. And we had two little pulpits up on the stage, and a lot of people were present, big group. And he said, the Gospels are too late the Gospels are too late to tell us anything about Jesus. And when people say things like that, it makes me angry when people give false information. I'm not saying he knew. I'm not saying he was lying. But it was so false. And he was a university professor, major university in our country. And he said, the Gospels are too late to be good sources. So when it was my turn to talk, I said, do you think we know a lot about Alexander the Great? He said, yeah, we do. We know a lot about Alexander. Are you sure? Yeah, we know a lot about Alexander. Do you know when the earliest extended account, I don't mean a line in a rock, the earliest extended account of Alexander, do you know how much later the earliest account was? Just short of 300 years later. And he's thought to be one of the best known people in ancient history, just short of 300 years. You know when the best two are written? Plutarch and Arian. Four and a quarter to 450. Is that the best we can do? Not pretty much. We're sure about Alexander. Yep. When are the Gospels written? Beginning about 40. What about Paul's epistles? Beginning about 20. And what about those early creeds you were talking about? Right after the cross happened. Right after the cross happened, we have these sources. We have a wealth of historical information. Do the critics agree? Yes, they do. And then they'll just say, ah, miracles don't happen. Look, anybody, does. you don't have to get married. You could know somebody better than anybody and never say, I do. And you can know a lot about Jesus and never say I do to Jesus. That's your business. But the critics allow the sources and the data, and that's not often known. 